today we're going to switch gear and uh, we're going to talk about why climate change is a problem. I'm going to spend three weeks on that and today I'm going to talk about uh, impacts from a physical perspective and a uh, biological and somewhat chemical uh, perspective. Um, I'm going to bring in adaptation uh, right from the start and if time permits we're going to talk about valuation as well. I should minimize this thing. Um, so that you can see uh, the slides. Uh, until today, I've given you the wrong schedule. <laughs> uh, so last year, we were told that we had 10 weeks. Um, so I changed the schedule and then a few weeks into term, <laughs> we were told, no, 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 it's an 11 week term, not a 10 week term. Um, <coughs> So I had reorganized everything, but not adjusted my schedule. Uh, so there's three weeks on the impacts of climate change. And then there's four weeks on um, climate policy is the adjustment I made last minute last year and is now properly reflected here. But let's uh, talk about the impacts of climate change. I'm gonna start uh, with the impacts on nature. Um, <coughs> If you uh, travel to Southern Europe, which uh, most of you uh, will have done, you notice immediately that vegetation is very different there. Uh, or if you travel to Scandinavia, you would also notice that vegetation is different there. Um, so it stands to reason uh, that if temperature go up, if rainfall changes, if you have different radiation, different cloud cover and all those sort of things, you would uh, see different plants. Um, now, some plants are directly uh, dependent on these things, and th their uh, spread is directly determined uh, by the climate. Uh, other plants are more determined actually by the competition with other plants, right? And then there's of course the animals that uh, eat the plants that are also affected, and then the animals that predate on those animals uh, are also affected, right? So <coughs> if the climate is different, you would expect a uh, different uh, landscape, you would expect uh, different ecosystems. <coughs> uh, this can be quite uh, profound. Um, what you're looking at here is a uh, graph that was produced in the still the latest uh, report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change from 2014. The new report comes out in two weeks. No, the new report comes out next week uh, on the 28th. Um, and no doubt there will be new graphs then. Uh, what you're looking at here is a map of model agreements. So there's a whole bunch of models. Uh, I talked previously about climate models. There's also a whole bunch of models that predict what vegetation will be like uh, in the future, <coughs> as well as in the past, right? Uh, these models can run. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. And here is model agreement and the darker the color the more models agree, and what models agree on is a biome shift. Now, a biome is something that is bigger than an ecosystem. <coughs> it's essentially a type uh, of nature. So rainforest would be a biome, tundra would be a biome, uh, temporal forest would be a biome. And then a biome shift means the rainforest turns into savanna, or, can, can I read? Uh, the tundra will reach, uh, will change into uh, boreal forest, right? So it's like a circle <coughs> of like different biomes turning into Yes. Well, uh, the, depending on what where you are, uh, what the rain does, what uh, <coughs> uh, what the temperature does. Rainfall is more important typically um, than temperature. Um, so this is a <coughs> wholesale change of the landscape, right? A wholesale change of nature. There's a big difference between a savanna landscape and a rainforest, uh, or between a tundra <coughs> and uh, a boreal forest. Um, so, th so that is one thing you see that actually in, in some places uh, there is like universal agreement that uh, things will look very, very different in the future. Um, <coughs> And um, yeah, it's also widespread. It's in many places in the world, you would see a completely different uh, landscape and a completely different nature and ecosystems in the future because of climate change. Um, 
you can put a little bit more structure uh, on this. Um, what we're going to see in the future uh, is uh, two things besides whole scale uh, change in nature. Uh, marginalized plants and animals are two things can happen. Either they can completely disappear or they may uh, boom, right? Uh, if you sort of like cling on at the margins of the existing circumstances change, either they change in your favor and that will be very good for you, um, but uh, you may also uh, completely disappear. Uh, specialized plants and animals uh, <coughs> are very likely uh, to lose out. Um, the example that you see here uh, is uh, Edelweiss. Um, Edelweiss grows in nature uh, high up in the Alps. The reason that it grows there is not because it likes it there. Nothing likes it there. And you get very high temperatures, a day, very cold nights, and occasionally you're covered in two meters of snow, right? This is pretty tough environment. Uh, Edelweiss is one of the toughest plants uh, in the world. It can survive there, but it's very bad at competition. So it cannot compete with other plants but high up in the Alps, there are no other plants, so Edelweiss is happy. Um, <coughs> now, if it gets hotter, where would Edelweiss go? Well, logically, to the mountaintops to the north. But it cannot travel through the valley, because there's other plants there, right? And also, it, it can sort of the wind can blow it, but if you look north of the Alps, the next mountain range is in Norway, right? Which is too far. So plants that are sort of specialized in very specific ecological niches are in trouble. Now, Edelweiss won't go extinct because Edelweiss also does well in gardens in England, provided there, there is a gardener to keep the weeds under control, right? Um, but in the wild, it may well go uh, <coughs> uh, extinct. Um, <coughs> if you go to Wakehurst, uh, they explain this for uh, the Vietnamese golden cypress uh, as well. Similar story, uh, these things grow in a very narrow range on the mountain. If it gets a little bit warmer, then they need to go up. And as you see, there's no topsoil uh, further north, so they have no place to grow. Right? So plants like this that occupy very specific uh, ecological niches are in trouble. Um, <coughs> now, this is true for nature, which we sometimes call unmanaged uh, ecosystems. Uh, it's also true for agriculture that <coughs> some places, uh, some plants, um, well, every plant will have to uh, adapt. <coughs> um, again, a picture from uh, the 2014 IPCC report. Uh, what you're looking at is what climate change would do to the three most important crops, uh, that is rice, wheat, and maize. Um, so this is most important in the sense of this is where we get most of our calories from uh, in uh, the temperate regions and in the tropical uh, regions. Um, <coughs> the scale is from 0 uh, to 5 uh, degrees, local uh, climate change, local warming uh, I should say, uh, and then the vertical scale is the change in yield. So this is essentially how much grain do you get from your field per acre. Um, <coughs> and uh, what do you see? Um, let's focus on the red curves first. Uh, if we take wheat, uh, which is a cold loving plant, if it gets warmer, wheat yields drop, right? Uh, both temperate uh, and uh, more pronounced in the tropical regions, up to 50%, right? So you, as a farmer, you get less 50% less of your farm, uh, which is quite considerable. Um, rice, uh, less pronounced because rice is a heat loving plant. Uh, same is true for maize, you see a less profound uh, response. Um, now you also see the uh, blue curves here, um, and they show something different, a different uh, pattern. So the difference between the red curve and the blue curve is that in the red curve the assumption is that farmers do not respond. 
that they continue to plant the same varieties at the same time, use the same amount of irrigation, use the same amount uh, of pesticides and fertilizers as they do now and harvest at the same time as they do now. In uh, the blue curves there is on-farm adaptation, very limited uh, on-farm adaptation, so different cultivars but not no switch from uh, wheat to maize for instance um, and different planting and harvesting dates uh, but not uh, much more uh, than that. Um, <coughs> and what you see is that the negatives then actually become less negative and in some cases the negatives become positives and climate is actually good for uh, production of some crops, right? Uh, here you see that adaptation doesn't help. The reason that the blue curve is below the red curve is selection bias that they did not know how to correct for. Uh, these are supposedly the world's top scientists. Um, but you see that adaptation is crucially important here. Um, <coughs> now the best way to explain to natural scientists um, about adaptation is the so-called Grunsberg uh, rule of adaptation after Howie Grunsberg um, also has a serious uh, <laughs> uh, economic uh, thing named after him if you're ever going to do transport economics um, Grunsberg's rule of adaptation is here we have a beach right uh, lots of people enjoying themselves uh, it's summer uh, if only it were right um, and the question is what would happen with sea level rise, right? Suppose that sea level rises by one meter, what would happen? Well, this person here lies with, I think it's a sea, uh, with her head 30 centimeters above the sand, right? So one meter of sea level rise and she would drown, right? Uh, and the same actually goes for lots of other people uh, that you have here. Would she drown if sea level rises by one meter? No, <laughs> because uh, actually the average time that people spend on a beach is two to three hours. Sea level will take mm, for a meter to rise, for a meter will take 150 years or so. So chances are sea will have vacated uh, the beach by then, right? Chances are that she may tell her grandchildren that this is a nice beach and they should go visit, uh, but when those grandchildren visit the beach, they will sort of recognize that the place where granny was is now flooded and therefore they should no, not go lie and sunbathe there, right? Because it's not in their self-interest. They have eyes and ears and they sort of like notice, ah, this is perhaps not the best place, right? <coughs> so this is the Grunsberg rule of adaptation. All these people will drown unless we assume adaptation. <coughs> now for uh, economists, I don't need to explain that people have agency, right? Uh, if you count the red, uh, the, the numbers that you see here in brackets, uh, are the number of studies that assume no adaptation versus the number of studies that assume adaptation. And in the natural sciences, it is still common to assume that people have no agency that farmers will continue to do the same thing year after year after year even if their crops fail and they see their crops fail they will continue to try and do what their grandfather did right um, which is the so-called dumb farmer hypothesis and really it's not the farmer who is dumb here it's the analyst Max because, well, the, the only explanation I have heard from a, a very famous agronomist, uh, that's a biologist who specializes in crops, in agricultural plants, uh, from a very famous agronomist is that people are too complicated, so we're just going to assume the people away. Of course, it's the dumbest assumption you can make, right? Mm -hmm. I mean the assumption that a farm is not ruled by uh, the pigs, right, as uh, George Orwell would have you, but the farm is ruled by the plants rather than the farmer, 
and that not even the plants adapt to climate change. It's just bizarre. But they just don't want to touch the social sciences. It's just fear of social science that drives this. Hmm? I do get yeah, yeah. Like the ju the justification for making a disputable assumption is making an indisputably bad assumption. Yeah. Like no, right? Grow up, grow up here. Um, the uh, <coughs> problem with this graph is that it's all over the place, right? So depending on where you are, depending on what you grow, you see some very large negatives, you see some small positives, and so on and so forth. What do you make of this? So one way of doing uh, that, making sense of it all, is to run it through a agricultural trade model where essentially you include national markets for food, demand and supply, as well as international trade uh, for food. Um, and that is done uh, in these studies here. And what you're looking at is, uh, again, similar climate uh, scenario. You're looking at what happens to the world average price for food. Um, where negative is good if you're a consumer, it's bad if you're a farmer, uh, and positive is uh, good for farmers, bad for consumers. And a positive price increase, of course, means law of demand that the supply has gone down, right? <coughs> now, you see uh, two groups of studies, uh, Perry and Fisher, show negative effects on output right from the start. Uh, Darwin is somewhere in between, uh, but Adams and Riley sort of show first positive impacts and then uh, negative uh, impacts. Um, and you may say, well, this has to do mostly with the mix, the crop mix that is in there. That is partly true. Uh, but the other thing uh, that distinguishes these studies from these studies is so-called CO2 fertilization. So, photosynthesis, uh, you may recall uh, what the plants do. Uh, they take light uh, from the sun, that is energy. They use that energy to break down, they, they take CO2 from the air, they take H2O from the soil mostly through their roots, and then they use the sunlight in photosynthesis to break down the H2O and the CO2 to and then bond them together to make a carbohydrate. That's the leaves and the stems and uh, the roots of the plant and the seeds, right? And then they dump the oxygen uh, into the atmosphere, right? That is what plants do. The CO2 is a crucial element in this and they need CO2 to grow. Um, how do plants get CO2? Well, they take it from the atmosphere through their stomata. You can think of stomata as little mouths that they need to open and grab the CO2 from the air. Now, if there's more CO2 in the air, this is easier. So they need to keep their mouths open for less long. Uh, that helps, that makes plants grow unless they're limited, grow, makes plants grow faster unless they're limited in other nutrients, right? And of course it doesn't help. Um, but even if they are limited in other nutrients, plants evaporate water through their stomata. Just as when you have a cold and you sleep with your mouth open, you wake up very, very thirsty with a very dry mouth. Same is true for plants. If there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, they can keep their mouths closed for longer, they evaporate less water, and they become more drought tolerant. Um, and of course, we have put more CO2 in the atmosphere, and that makes plants grow faster. And if you include those effects, as Darwin and Riley did, uh, no, as Adams and Riley did, you find initially positive effects on uh, global foods, on the global food supply. Uh, <coughs> but in the longer run, the negative effects of less rainfall uh, and higher temperatures uh, dominate, right? Note that we are already somewhere here, right, in terms of warming. So uh, don't get overexcited uh, about this. 
No, I said that adaptation is crucially important. Um, if you are talking about agriculture, it's not just farmers who adapt or should adapt, right? There's also across the world large elements of uh, public interference in agricultural system. Um, what you're looking at is a map, uh, 10 years old now, uh, of the agricultural subsidies in the European Union, and the UK is still uh, a part of that. Um, and what you see, and the darker the color, the greater the subsidy. Um, and what you see is that the European Common Agricultural Policy um, has two purposes. Uh, and the one that you see displayed on the map is an equalization of farmer incomes. So the worse you are as a farmer, the greater the subsidy you get. And if you are uh, a very stubborn farmer and you try and grow stuff up in the mountains uh, in Portugal, which you shouldn't do because it's stony ground, bad climate, just don't grow stuff there. Don't be silly. Um, or high up uh, in Finland, uh, you get compensated for essentially doing things that a farmer shouldn't, right? You should grow food here, where it grows very well, right? Or uh, in southern England, uh, where food grows very well. Um, so that is one thing uh, that agricultural subsidies do. Uh, the other thing that agricultural subsidies do, uh, and this is not just in uh, Europe, but this is across the world, if the agricultural market collapses, then support goes up. So if prices are down, subsidies are up, and vice versa. So essentially, in the US, in Australia, um, in other places, if farming goes bad, the government steps in and gives out money. Now the implication of both subsidy systems is that essentially farmers are shielded not just from market volatility that is outside their control, but are also shielded from making bad decisions. Right? <laughs> Harvest collapses, yeah, somebody else is going to give you money, so why should you want to maintain your harvest, right? Um, <coughs> and of course, if circumstances change, then that manifests itself, if climate changes, that manifests itself by more and more bad harvests. And then what you would want is farmers to change their behavior. And the best way of doing that is have their incomes collapse so that they have a reason to change their behavior, right? But through these subsidies, it actually uh, works uh, the other way around. Uh, subsidies in Europe as well, uh, in the EU as well as in the UK, are now being reformed to reward traditional farming. So essentially we are incentivizing farmers to do things the old way. Now of course with climate change, if circumstances change, you should do things the new way, right? Not the old way. Um, so uh, subsidy reforms actually make things uh, worse. Uh, another thing, uh, of course, that you would see if climate changes drastically is that you would grow crops in completely different places, right? Um, and that of course then means if diets don't change that you would need more international trade. But uh, our system of tariffs is still such that we shield farmers from foreign competition, right? Go ahead. One thing that's sort of really confused me is it feels like the opponents of you know, the invented the environment and stuff like that in regards to agriculture it seems to be so adverse to using any sort of new technologies and implementing them into like agriculture like vertical farming and stuff like that seems to terrify those because obviously those sorts of people are that like shamans yeah um <laughs> I just don't get it uh, we, we talked about it last term uh, the roots of the environmental movement lie in Romanticism. Uh, romanticism is a rejection of industrialism. 
and it's a sort of an elevation of a mythical past right and everything was small scale and organic and everybody lived in small villages and everybody was nice to each other all the time that is that never happened in history right but in romantic notions that is how it was and the past was always better than the future could ever be and that then implies also a rejection of new technologies because we reboot culture mm -hmm. yeah um, and <coughs> r r r romanticism is I mean it, it started as a response to enlightenment and uh, the first uh, industrialization although also if you read some Greek and Roman ancient Greek and Roman writers they also had something against modern agriculture but they fought modern agriculture right um, it's a remarkably strong feeling uh, amongst many it's shared by many many people and it it, it it probably has to do with misremembrance right and you guys are too young for this but um, if you get older you you get more and more responsibilities and life becomes uh, not as nice as it is now um, and you sort of like remember your childhood as something where you had no worries because somebody else worried for you and solved all your problems, right? Um, and I think it stems from that, that people sort of like remember their childhood as being completely free of any worries or concerns and therefore the past was better than the future. That's just not true. It's you just had everything taken care of you right? <laughs> um, at that time rather than you know, to worry about it yourself I think it, it comes from that but uh, I'm not 100% sure okay um, <coughs> next uh, impact of climate is on uh, water and water resources um, and I'm going to use it also to talk a little bit about how to uh, adapt uh, so climate obviously affects uh, rainfall right that comes uh, with it but it also affects the demand for water if it gets uh, warmer you need to drink more you need to irrigate your plants harder you also need more cooling water for your uh, uh, for your uh, power plants <coughs> uh, and of course it also affects the supply uh, of water um, this map here is again from the 2014 IPCC report um, is a badly colored map um, for any colorblind people here uh, you probably have an issue <laughs> uh, with the choice of colors it is also uh, bad in the sense that uh, red is good and blue is bad um, so if you're colorblind uh, you can't see the distinction anyway uh, so what are we looking at what we're looking at is the return period in the future of the hundred year flood so that is the flood not that comes every hundred years but the flood that has every year probability of occurring of one in a hundred or one percent um, and that return period uh, can go up that means that floods will become less frequent uh, tenfold uh, increase in there uh, but it may also become more frequent and in the very dark blue what used to happen once in a century now happens every other year right um, <coughs> in terms of runoff um, and what you see is there's large parts of the world that are blue right where because of the intensification of the water cycle there's water evaporates faster there's more water that can be contained in the atmosphere and that means that there's also more water that can fall out of the atmosphere right uh, in a short uh, burst um, so in large parts of the world you actually see an increase in flood risks uh, including uh, where we are um, uh, but in some parts of the world you would actually see uh, a decrease uh, in flood risks uh, which of course may pose other problems uh, one problem with uh, the Rhine which is badly uh, shown here but also with some of the other uh, rivers in Central Europe uh, is that if there's less water in you can't sail your ship right 
and there's a lot of stuff that is still transported over water right so uh, those may be uh, issues uh, as well and there may also be issues um, with there's not simply not being enough uh, water uh, for uh, drinking uh, and irrigation right so it may go um, depending where you are it, 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 it may go uh, different ways uh, but also this decrease in flood frequency of course means less floods but it also may imply more droughts right so this is not necessarily uh, a positive uh, story <coughs> so this is what would happen in the natural environment um, now how would you cope with it um, in the first lecture, I actually talked about the different projections of climate change, and I showed a wide range, right? Globally surface air temperature will increase during a lifetime somewhere between one and six degrees, right? That's a huge range. Um, and you may wonder, like, how do I cope with that sort of uncertainty? In many cases, this is actually uh, not a big deal. And here we see uh, that range again. If you're a wheat farmer, then you don't care about the climate for 2050 because there's three months between you sowing your wheat and the harvest of the wheat. The only thing that matters to you is the weather over the next three months. Right? And then next year you decide to plant a little bit later, to plant a different cultivar, uh, and so on and so forth. It doesn't really matter. Uh, similarly, for the people uh, sunbathing, it doesn't really matter if you like sunbathing, you can go to a different place, right? If it gets too hot uh, where you used to go, or if the beach has disappeared, you go somewhere else, right? So these are decisions that you make on a very short rotation, right? Uh, <coughs> so it's only this, this uncertainty only really matters when you make long-term investments, right? Then it matters what the climate will be in 30 years' time, if indeed the thing that you're building will last for another 30 years. <coughs> um, I showed uh, this one as well in the first lecture. Um, this is uh, how rainfall will change in uh, winter uh, and in summer. Uh, blue means wettening, uh, red means drying, uh, and you see indeed that in some places uh, it will get wetter in winter, uh, but drier in summer. So you need to be prepared for both, which is difficult, right? Um, so in uh, Southeast England we have a problem with floods in winter. And one way to solve that is to deepen the rivers, right? So that the water flows faster to the sea. And that means that you have less of a flooding problem in winter. The problem with doing that is that the water then also flows faster in summer. And we have a drought problem in summer, right? So you actually want to think of a solution where you transport water faster in winter but slower in summer uh, so you need some sort of very engineered uh, river system with sluices and uh, stuff to keep the water in or instead of having the water flow faster in winter you need to retain the water say on agricultural land that you then turn them into temporary lakes in winter and then uh, <coughs> hopefully uh, you also make it through the drought in summer and that is of course the solution that people have opted for in England, right? Um, now there is another problem uh, <coughs> with this map uh, and that is the uh, dotted areas and in the dotted areas which you see are basically everywhere there is model disagreement about the sign of the change So some models, uh, a third of the models say, or three quarters of the models say it's going to get wetter, and the rest of the models say it's going to get drier. Sorry, was that where it's dotted? That's where it's dotted. Uh, which is in a lot of places, like including places where there's actually a lot of people uh, directly dependent uh, on agriculture, such as in southern Africa. Um, so if you're adapting to temperature, you know, you, you do not know exactly how much warmer it's going to get in the future, 
but you do know it getting warmer, right? You're worried about sea level rise, you don't know exactly how much sea level will rise, but you do know that it will rise. Uh, if you're concerned with water, it may get wetter, it may get drier, right? Um, <coughs> so this is actually a um, difficult uh, problem. Uh, and the solution here is, well, one thing that you do know is that climate will change, right? So future rainfall will not be like today's rainfall. That is something that would, that would be physically impossible, right? That the climate warms but rainfall stays the same. That just doesn't make any sense. Um, so what you will need to do in these cases is, well, <laughs> you know that things will be different. So you will need to do things differently. You don't know how. So either you need to make the whole system more robust that it can withstand everything and anything that the climate may throw at you uh, or you need to have the option to adjust as you learn how climate will actually change in your locality so you need to build things modular uh, or in a way that it can be uh, changed easily uh, so just pouring concrete everywhere right that is probably not your best option because that is very hard to adjust, right? Unless, of course, and you've seen that uh, in some places, no doubt, you have these concrete things and you have all these metal things uh, stick out. And you wonder, why did they not finish this and take away those metal bars? Well, actually, if you do that, it's easy to put additional concrete on later. If you don't have those metal sticks uh, stick out, then the only way to adjust it is to take away the old concrete and build everything uh, from the ground up again, right? That is why you sometimes see these metal bars stick out of concrete. But it's not because they did not finish the job, that is because uh, they wanted to keep things flexible, right? But that is what uh, you should do. <coughs> make things more robust, make things more flexible, prepare for the future. It's of course also important that you incentivize the people to actually do this. Max, go ahead. Um. It just seems like flexibility is something that people feel a lot of people do. I feel like it's sort of not true. Why, 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 why do you say that? Because that involves long term thinking and people don't know that. Um, <coughs> well, all of this requires long term thinking, right? So I, I was actually just starting there that you, yeah, you need. You need to incentivize your people to do this. If, if, you, if you ask an engineer to design something for an uncertain climate future, they get excited, right? Because this is an intellectually exciting, this is a difficult problem to solve. And engineers like solving difficult uh, problems. Um, but of course, it will only pay off in 30 years time, right? So you don't want a sort of a bureaucracy where people don't care, right? and things will go wrong after I retire, so who cares, right? That is not, you, you want people who take professional pride in there or in some way directly incentivize them to take care about the long term, right? Uh, a lot of this sort of adaptation actually takes place below the radar. Uh, the politicians in charge are actually not aware of what the engineers are doing and the engineers are just silently, quietly doing the right things. Um, of course, they need a little bit extra budget and so on and so forth uh, to do so. So, 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 so that definitely helps. Um, <coughs> in terms of flexibility, uh, so, so the big issues here are long-lived infrastructure that has to do with water. Uh, what we have seen uh, in the last 20, 30 years or so is engineers, water engineers moving away from hard infrastructure to soft infrastructure um, where I, I know coastal engineering much better than irrigation uh, engineering um, what they used to do is instead of what they used to do is if you have a problem with sea level rise or with 
coastal erosion when you build a big dike or you build groins or you build a seawall, something like that. That is the traditional uh, uh, coastal engineering approach. Hard infrastructure, right? You make the whole thing more robust. Poor on concrete, uh, big blocks of granite. What they have moved towards is to say, well, if you have an erosion problem, that means that you don't have enough sediment in on your coast and you should just dump sand somewhere and then natural flow of water and everything will put the sand where it's most needed um, and that, that is an approach that was uh, pioneered in the Netherlands and very successfully there um, but you also see it now being used uh, in Southampton uh, for instance so actually if you travel that way there's, there's two things going on. One is Portsmouth where <laughs> they're building seawalls <laughs> or they were building seawalls last summer, they probably finished now. Uh, whereas in uh, Southampton, just across, uh, they were just dumping sand and let it sort out and then uh, that was their protection and you can actually see the contrast. Uh, the, 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 the good thing about the more natural approach is that it also fits much better in this whole idea of a multifunctional coast where if you do this you create new islands that can be used for recreation uh, that can be used for nature conservation and so on and so forth uh, what you see happening in the, in the Netherlands at the moment uh, is that there's little money for uh, additional coastal protection but there's a lot of money for nature conservation and essentially the entire um, strengthening of the coast is done through nature protection so artificial islands that are good for birds and stuff but also break the waves right uh, so. there's, uh, there's actually within engineers there's a lot of or among engineers there's a lot of emphasis on the flexible uh, system and the sort of natural systems rather than concrete as they used to do um, <coughs> now I emphasize that all of this is only important if you have a slow system uh, with a lot of long lived um, a long li lot of long lived capital uh, if uh, Lacey is cold she puts on her coat right and if she gets hot she takes off her coat again she doesn't need to plan 50 years ahead for this right um, May, and this this is the bulk of the adaptation to climate change, right? It's sort of like very short-term uh, decisions. Uh, I wasn't picking on you. Uh, it was just a good introduction to um, what I was going to say. I'm going to finish this story and then we're going to have a break uh, and a shorter uh, second half. Um, so climate change also affects uh, energy production, energy consumption. Energy consumption is clear, right? If it gets warmer in winter you need less energy to heat your home uh, if it gets warmer in summer you need more energy to cool uh, the place energy production is also affected um, obviously wind and solar are directly dependent on climate but also thermal plants are less efficient when it's hot uh, or you need more cooling water um, also the transport of electricity actually resistance in power lines goes up when it's warmer uh, so there's uh, issues uh, there as well <coughs> climate obviously affects tourism uh, where we go what we do there it affects construction uh, it affects transport um, and so on and so forth so this is a whole range of impacts i won't have time uh, to talk about um, but instead i'm going to talk um, a little bit about uh, being hot or cold um, so climate also has effects on um, human health and labor productivity. So we are warm-blooded animals. That means that we need to keep the temperature of our bodies uh, at 37 degrees Celsius, right? And if it deviates too much from that, you're die, you're dead essentially, right? Uh, three degrees uh, warmer, two degrees colder, and uh, essentially fatal. Um, so we have developed fairly strong mechanisms to uh, do that, right? And there's two things in particular. Um, one, uh, if it gets very hot, 
you start sweating, right? It's essentially you evaporate water to uh, cool your body. Um, problem with uh, this is that it has uh, limits, right? Um, and particularly uh, evaporation of water is much, much more difficult if the air is humid. And if the humidity goes up to 100%, that means that the air is saturated with water and that means that you can't evaporate more, right? So sweating uh, doesn't uh, help. Um, which explains why uh, heat is much more, m much worse for you uh, when in a humid climate than in a, a dry, uh, on a, on a, in a humid day than on a dry day, right? Um, Fifty-five degrees Celsius. Dry heat is the point where actually heat becomes fatal. You've all heard of Death Valley, right? It's called Death Valley because if you spend too long uh, in Death Valley without air conditioning outside of your car, you actually die, right? At fifty-five degrees, actually your body, your cells in your body start decomposing. And if you do that for a couple of hours, then uh, that's the end of it. That actually goes down to 35 degrees in uh, with 100% humidity, right? That is sort of the physical uh, limits uh, that we have. Um, now, the besides uh, these sort of uh, effects, there's other issues as well, and that is that heat stress actually takes a lot of energy out of your body. Now, you guys may recall last summer um, when there was a heat wave and you were very tired, right? But you guys are young and healthy. Um, if you're very young or very old or you have uh, pre-existing cardiovascular or respiratory problems, then heat stress may actually be fatal, right? Um, Similar problems happen with cold stress. Um, obviously, if you uh, go naked uh, outside uh, last night, uh, you wouldn't last very long, right? Now, very few people die uh, of cold stress uh, in that way. Uh, but you still, you need to keep yourself warm, so you spend a lot of energy heating uh, your body. Uh, and again, people with pre-existing uh, cardiovascular problems may succumb to cold stress. There's another thing uh, that I don't need to remind you of. What people do in winter time is they spend much more time indoors and before COVID they spend a lot of time closer to other people and that meant that sort of all sorts of infectious diseases run rampant when it is cold. Not because it is cold but because of our response to that cold. Um, and what you see is that during colder winters uh, lots of people die of particularly uh, influenza, right? Um, actually, the increase or the decrease in cold stress because of warmer warming is probably larger, perhaps much larger than the increase in deaths due to uh, heat stress. Definitely the more temperate parts uh, of the planet. Um, now, this is a health problem. This is also a problem with labor productivity. If it's very warm, you cannot work as hard. Uh, so this is an immediate problem for people working on construction, people uh, doing farming outdoors, and it gets warmer still. Uh, labor productivity may drop, uh, and may drop uh, fairly uh, large, uh, very large amounts. Uh, some of the projections for mid-century is that labor productivity in places like Southeast Asia would fall by 30-40%. Now, if you recall your micro, you would know that the weights in equilibrium is equal to your labor productivity. So if labor productivity falls by 30%, that means that your equilibrium weights would go down by 30%, right? So this is a big hit uh, for people. Um, so there's all sorts of uh, issues uh, with this. Um, the week after next, I'm also going to talk about other issues related to health, namely uh, particularly malaria, right? Uh, 
mosquitoes and the malaria uh, parasite also like it warm and wet and are likely to thrive uh, in a warmer, wetter uh, future. Now what can you do? Um, you can, um, what should you do uh, when it's very warm? Um, I'll finish this one and then we're going to have a break. Um, what should you do uh, during heat wave? Uh, you should wear little clothes, right? Uh, you should stay calm, you should keep out of the sun. Also when you're English, you should keep out of the sun uh, when uh, it's very hot. Uh, and you should drink lots, but no alcohol, right? Because alcohol opens your pores, you actually lose uh, uh, more water when you do so. Now, all of these things are stuff that your mother should have taught you, right? When you were small. Actually, when you have small children, you will realize that until they're five or so, they don't understand this. Uh, but from that point onwards, they can sort this out for themselves. You don't need the government to tell you that this is what you should uh, do. Uh, so this is very much a private sort of response, right? Now, not everything here is private. Some of these adaptations are actually collective. Um, so people in Southern Europe, in uh, uh, Latin America, hold siestas, uh, which actually makes a lot of sense to sleep during the heat of the day and then make up working in the evening, right? Uh, it's not because you're they're lazy, this just makes physiological sense that the time of the day when you can do very little, you do very little. Um, <coughs> also, if you uh, go to Barcelona or to Valencia or places like that, you notice that people have their dinner very late. Again, this is an adaptation to climate because you actually spend a lot of energy digesting your food, so that heats up your body, and definitely if you also then eat hot food, that heats up your body. You do that during the cool of night, not during the day, right? Um, now, <coughs> these sort of things are collective, right? These are not individual decisions. You can't decide for yourself to hold a siesta, because we schedule classes uh, during that time, right? Uh, and if you go to northern Germany and you go to a restaurant after seven o'clock, they like look at you like, good people are in bed by now, right? <laughs> no, they have dinner at seven. Uh, so there's obviously sort of social norms here, right? That matter, and that need to be adjusted if the climate gets warmer. Um, and the government really has nothing uh, to do here, right? This is social norm, cultural norms. Uh, the best what the government can do is run uh, heat awareness uh, and uh, preparedness campaigns. So you may take away from this, well, adaptation to climate definitely here is mostly a private affair. Now you would be wrong uh, in thinking uh, <coughs> so. Uh, and uh, to illustrate that, I'm going to look at three heat waves. Uh, the first one was the 2003 heat wave in France where depending on the estimate between 40 and 50,000 people died during uh, summer. 40,000, right? So that is, we'll make it 45,000, and that is uh, 9,000 people died during 9-11, right? When the Twin Towers came down, this was more, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, this was a lot more. Now, what happened in France? Well, it was very hot, right? Um, but there were also all sorts of things going wrong in uh, the health system. And a lot of people reported to uh, their doctors or tried to report to their doctors or their hospitals uh, with symptoms of heat stress. But this was in August and it was in France, so everybody was on holiday. <coughs> Simply, there weren't enough doctors and nurses around to help uh, these people. There was also no protocol in place to call these nurses and doctors back from their holidays. The only person who had the authority to do so was the Minister for Health, and he was on holiday as well, and did not bother to read the newspapers about what was going on in his country. He should have been tried for genocide, right? And uh, he wasn't. Um, but essentially the problem was 
that the health system did not support these people and that could have prevented 20 or 35,000 people dying, right? They've learned from that, right? And not just in France, what we now see throughout Europe, including the UK, is that there is proper heat pro protocols, what to do during a heat wave, right? Uh, including advice, but also uh, how uh, health professionals should respond. Uh, but this was a very clear failure of the public system. And the public system has learned from this, right? This is a form of adaptation to climate change assuming that the heat wave was due to climate change. Um, the other um, examples come from uh, Pittsburgh and uh, Chicago. Uh, Pittsburgh, there was also a, no, in Chicago, there was also a heat wave. Um, and a lot of people died and they went back through a post-mortem and sort of say what happened, what, how could we have prevented this. Um, one of the things that they figured out was that a lot of poorer people don't have air conditioning and what you then do is you go to an air conditioned place, right? That's a um, logical adaptation. You go to a shopping mall, but th those were poor people and they were obviously not buying things, so they were kicked out of the shopping malls, right? Back into the heat. Right, so security guards need to be told, well, during when it's very hot outside, perhaps just let people seek relief from the heat, right? In uh, Pittsburgh, no, nothing. In Philly, Philadelphia, um, also a heat wave, they also went in with post-mortem and what they discovered is that there were many people who were in their apartment slowly cooked to death and they did not turn on their fans even though they did have air conditioners they did not turn them on because they could not afford the electricity again you would want a public response here that during these times you drop the price of electricity or you give out vouchers for electricity right something like that but that was not in place they do that now um, what they also found is that on the ground floor people refuse to open their windows and the reason for that was that they were so afraid of crime um, and they would rather risk the death and risk or actually <laughs> uh, get uh, die uh, because of heat than run the chance that somebody would come in uh, and do unspeakable things uh, to them right um, so again, th this is not just a private thing, but it's also a public thing. What you want during uh, heat waves is more police on the streets to make people feel safer, at least in those places where the police makes you feel safe, right? Um, now that is a thing that you want to do uh, anyway, <coughs> because there's other things that happen during heat waves. Uh, and one is that heat doesn't just make you tired, it also makes people cranky and uh, it also affects cognition and self-control. So what happens during heat waves is that people get violent and whereas your neighbor used to be annoying and you ignored him now he's annoying and you go beat him up, right? Um, so for that reason also you want more police on the street in those places where police will make you feel safe. Uh, now there's another thing about self-control and that is that also sexual crime goes up during heat waves. Right? And there's now fairly robust evidence that this has nothing to do with more women being on the street, that there's more opportunity, or the way that they dress, that they uh, seem like more uh, appetizing. This has everything to do with self-control of the male perpetrators, right? So, you guys have been warned, right? Don't be that asshole. You lose your self-control when it's hot. Make sure that you don't, right? Um, in all these cases, 
adaptation is a mix of public and private action, right? It's not something that people can just sort out for themselves. The government also needs to adjust what it's doing. Sea level rise. <coughs> so in the first week I showed that if temperatures goes up in the atmosphere then the temperature of the ocean also goes up and that means that water expands and that means that sea level rises and then of course you've also ice melt <coughs> as well as ice uh, displacement. Uh, and now the implication of this is uh, coastal erosion, a lot of land loss, uh, permanent inundation, um, unless of course uh, you protect uh, your coasts by uh, dikes and groins and uh, what have you. Um, <coughs> besides uh, the thing that uh, we directly care about, uh, that is uh, agricultural land and uh, buildings and stuff, uh, there's also wetland loss. And uh, now the natural response if, uh, for coastal wetlands, if that sea level rises, then the wetland just migrates uh, inland. Essentially what used to be dry land turns into uh, wetland. And there isn't much of a loss of area uh, of the wetland, provided that sea level rise is not too fast. If it's very fast, then the wetlands just drown. Um, now, <coughs> if you protect your coast, if you protect your agricultural land by building dikes and stuff, then the wetlands have no space to migrate inland. And they would indeed drown uh, and uh, disappear. Uh, and that is particularly problematic for uh, migratory birds who rely on wetlands uh, for uh, food and stuff and it's also particularly important for um, fish and particularly juvenile fish spent closer to the coast in the shallower uh, areas where the big predators aren't and um, so this is has ramifications uh, for all sorts of uh, food chains and all sorts of uh, habitats and all sorts of nature uh, further down the line. Um, one of the more uh, dramatic impacts that people talk about um, when they uh, talk about sea level rise uh, has to do with small islands, particularly atoll uh, islands, that are islands that are built of coral uh, reefs uh, and many of them are only a meter or so above uh, sea level and the projections of sea level rise are for next century are in the order of a meter maybe two meters in the longer run uh, projections are much higher than that uh, and that would imply that those islands completely uh, disappear uh, and some of them some entire countries uh, Tuvalu uh, for instance would disappear uh, before the century is over a lot of people are worried about that that concern is actually misplaced uh, in the sense that there is a much bigger problem uh, that they have to deal with. Um, the sea is salty, right? We rely on fresh water as do our crops uh, rely on fresh water. If uh, sea level rises then that also changes the pressure on groundwater, right? And there's, there's more salty water out there and that this pushes uh, the fresh groundwater inland, right? And closer to the shore, things will become brackish, and that means uh, useless uh, as sources of drinking water or sources of irrigation water. Um, <coughs> now, in a place like uh, England, that is not such a big deal. Um, essentially, a meter of sea level rise would mean that sort of the, the salt water lands Breckers water lands would sort of like move 10, maybe 100 meters uh, further inland, right? So you would see sort of the Breckers seawater get 100 meters further away from the shore uh, than it used to be, which is a small strip of land. Now, most atoll islands for their drinking water rely on groundwater. But if you have a small island, then the intrusion of salt water into your fresh groundwater, even if it's only 10 meters, even if it's uh, 50 meters, actually means that you can lose all your drinking water pretty rapidly. And uh, for small islands, um, actually, they will lose their fresh groundwater within decades. And that means 50 years before the island disappears under the sea, it will actually become. 
uh, uninhabitable because of lack of uh, fresh water. Uh, so that is a much more urgent uh, problem for them. Uh, in all of these things, adaptation is again crucially important. One solution for a lack of fresh water is of course desalination of uh, seawater. Uh, it's a technology that is getting better and cheaper uh, all the time. Um, for uh, the rest, uh, the adaptation is really in the form of building uh, dikes and seawalls. Um, and this is crucially important. Um, what you're looking at uh, here are a scenario of sea level rise uh, up to one and a half meters. Um, this is on the uh, vertical axis, it's the uh, number of people flooded uh, per year. Uh, there's no distinction in how you're flooded. So if you get your toes wet, you're counted the same as if you get your head wet, right? Uh, getting your toes wet is obviously less of a problem. Um, and then three alternative scenarios, a lot of climate change. A lot of climate change, not so much, very little climate change. Um, I don't know why it's in that order. Um, and what you see, and this is a logarithmic scale, if we focus on uh, the red line uh, for the moment, that the number of people flooded would go up from some 50 million uh, per year, uh, roughly, right? Uh, and may go to 500 million people per year. So that's a tenfold increase. Um, which is quite uh, dramatic. Um, now the uh, two dashed lines are uh, scenarios of uh, adaptation. Uh, <coughs> so in the solid red line at the top, the assumption is no additional dike building. We keep coastal protection as it is now. Uh, and then in see, indeed you see a tenfold uh, increase. Uh, in the uh, dashed line, let's call it that way, an enhanced adaptation or evolving uh, protection, sorry. Um, we keep not the dikes as they are, but we keep the protection standard as it is. So dikes are designed to protect against the 100 year flood or the 1000 year flood or something like that. The Thames barrier, for instance, is designed on the 1250 year flood. So the Thames barrier would be breached once every millennium on average, right? Um, and here you essentially strengthen your coastal protection so as to keep the protection standard as it is uh, today. You see that it makes uh, a difference. It's a logarithmic scale, so the difference is not as small as it appears. In the uh, dotted line, a different assumption is made, namely that uh, protection levels, design standards, evolve according to what we observe across the world at the moment. Okay, we see that a city like London is well protected against storm surges, whereas a city like Lagos is not, or Abidjan uh, is not. Um, and if you uh, look at pictures of Lagos, it's very easy uh, to find online. You see a lot of people just living on the beach, essentially. And uh, whenever there's a storm, uh, they get flooded and there's just nothing in between uh, them. And then in the richer parts of Lagos, there is a seawall that is a bit high. And it doesn't uh, help much. And it sort of like keeps the high tide out uh, once a year, but does not withstand uh, a storm. Now, why is that? Uh, because there's a lot of concentration of wealth uh, in London and therefore there is a real good reason to protect that. There's also a lot of concentration of people in Lagos, but they're very poor uh, and the government is fairly disorganized. And therefore there is no coastal protection offered. But if you look at it across the world, then what you see is that richer parts, more densely populated parts of the world are much better protected against these things than the poorer parts. Uh, now, recall that the emissions of CO2 are driven by economic growth, right? And it's the emissions of CO2 that drive climate change and drive sea level rise. So you can't really assume a world that is hotter in the future without assuming economic growth. Um, so in uh, this dotted um, 
uh, scenario, the assumption is, is that people grow richer, they start protecting themselves against storm surges. Um, and if you do that, you actually make a factor of 10 difference again, goes back to 50 uh, million. Um, so sea level rise and adaptation have the same order of magnitude effect. Sea level rise makes things 10 times worse, adaptation makes things 10 times better. Right? Adaptation here is crucially important. Now, nobody has asked me why don't these lines all start in the same point, right? And the answer is uh, we uh, have to have the calibration of the model, right? But the orders of magnitude in the future are correct. <coughs> so, I have 20 minutes left. Do we move this stuff to next week, or shall I just continue for then running the risk that next week I will again run out of time? Okay. You want to continue? Push on. Push on. Okay. Three silent, two votes for. So I'm just going to push on. So I've talked about impacts of climate change and sea level rise, and I did so in physical terms mostly. People flooded, uh, people dying of heat stress, and those sort of terms. And what I told you is that there's all sorts of impacts, and some of them I went through very quickly, and some of them I did not talk about at all. And some were big, some were small, some were positive, some were negative, dependent on when you are and where you are and who you are. So you can't make much sense. Is climate change a big problem or a small problem? Is it good for you? Is it bad for you? That doesn't make a lot of uh, sense. <coughs> so we need to somehow aggregate things into, um, into something that makes more sense. And there's various ways of doing that. Uh, this is actually from uh, the 2001 report of the IPCC. There's essentially two ways of doing this. Either you can zoom in, in on things that really matter to you. And that could, for instance, be the extinction of species. And if you care about those sort of things, or you care about uh, what's going on in small islands, uh, atoll islands, then climate change is an enormous problem. You just zoom in on these certain things. As I said, uh, Tuvalu will probably have to be evacuated within 30 years. Um, we have already documented extinctions of species because of climate change. And it will only get worse, right? So if that is sort of your mindset, let's focus on the vulnerable, then climate change is a big problem. <coughs> you can also focus on the big planetary changes. What if the Gulf Stream collapses? What if uh, West Antarctica slides into sea? And then actually climate change, I mean, these, those things won't happen this century, probably not next century. Uh, more likely the second half of the millennium that you ne really need to start worrying about these things and then climate change is less of a problem. Uh, what I'm going to do um, next week and then the week after uh, is aggr oh, next week and then the week after is focus on the average welfare effect. What does it do to the welfare of the average human uh, and on the distribution of that. And in order to do so, I'm going to aggregate everything. And uh, unsurprising uh, to you, uh, I'm going to use money to make everything comparable. Right? I'm going to express everything into its monetary uh, equivalent. Now, we talked extensively. In some of these cases, this is easy. right? If we're talking about effects on agriculture, those are things that are traded on markets, so we know the price. If we're talking about coastal protection, then those are not so much traded on markets, but you can call an engineer to get a price quote uh, for um, strengthening your dike, right? So f in those cases, it's actually fairly easy to monetize those impacts. Um, in other cases, it is not, but last term we talked extensively uh, about methods to put a price on the impacts on nature and the impacts on human health, right? Those are the two uh, big ones. Um, 
I talked about refill preference methods, travel costs that you use, the time and the money that people spend to go to a park as sort of an indication on how much they value that park or how much they are willing to pay extra for a house that sits in a beautiful environment, right? And that's an indication of their valuation of that environment. Um, and I also said, well, this works for direct consumption of landscape uh, and nature, but it doesn't work for all sorts of indirect reasons or even ex uh, existence values, right? Um, and for those types of values, we have to turn to stated preferences, where you're not looking at the actual behavior, not looking at people putting money on the table to buy something that they want, but you ask them how much they would be willing to pay for something. Uh, the good thing is that you can apply this to anything and everything. Uh, the bad thing is that this is purely uh, hypothetical, right? And people have all sorts of reasons to not give you, to not answer truthfully, or they may simply not be bothered to discover the truth because they're not putting uh, their money where their mouth is, right? <coughs> so we talked about these things uh, extensively. Um, and there's no need to repeat that. There's two things that I did not talk about last term. Um, and the first one is willingness to pay versus willingness to accept. Uh, so willingness to pay is the common term. The technical term is the Hicksian equivalent variation. Is the maximum amount you are willing to pay to secure a price fall. How much money are you willing to give for uh, to for something to become cheaper, right? Uh, now typically, we don't think uh, in these terms, but this is how it's defined. Uh, Hahnemann actually showed that you can just as well uh, replace a price fall with actually getting something. So, how much are you willing to pay for uh, a jar of peanut butter, right? Uh, that would be your equivalent uh, variation. Willingness to accept compensation, or the Hicksian compensating variation, is the minimum amount you would be willing to accept to lose something that you have. Right? So in this scenario, uh, let's switch to milk. How much are you willing to pay uh, to buy a pint of milk? And this is, you just bought a pint of milk and you walk out onto uh, the street and somebody knocks it out of your hand and uh, you drop it on the floor, what would you demand in compensation from this person for the loss of your milk, right? <coughs> so those are uh, the two sort of basic ways of valuing things. Now, Willig has a paper, fairly old by now, where he shows that our usual measure, the change in consumer surplus, actually lies somewhere between the equivalent variation and the compensating variation. And the compensating variation is always bigger than the equivalent uh, variation. And that is uh, because of the income effect. Right? If you're buying something, you give up some of your money, so there is an opportunity cost. Whereas if somebody gives you money, that is not constrained by your budget, your budget expands, and that is actually uh, a good thing, right? Uh, so <coughs> your compensating variation, the amount you demand in compensation, uh, should be bigger than your willingness to pay because your income is different in the two scenarios. Uh, Willig also showed that actually, when we're talking about something simple like a pint of milk, the two three measures should be practically indistinguishable from each other, right? We're talking about paying a pound for something and getting a pound in conversation for something that does not change your budget constraint in any meaningful way. Um, <coughs> now, people, and uh, some of you, if, if you do behavioral, you uh, would have seen a graph like this. People have done experiments on this uh, and the first experiments go back to Kahneman and Tversky and um, Richard Thaler, right? Um, and the other guy, uh, Jack Nett. But they did these experiments uh, and they did experiments with students about candy bars, right? Uh, 
that one, they did experiments with students and they split them into two groups and one half was sort of asked how much would you be willing to pay for this Mars bar uh, and the other half was given a Mars bar and then the professor tried to buy the Mars bar back from the students and they did it with coffee mugs and everything. And what they found was that there was this strange discrepancy between the prices and that is what you see here. Uh, this is the ratio of the willingness to accept compensation, the uh, compensating variation over the willingness uh, to pay. Um, and Willich said that ratio should be one. And here we see the number of studies uh, that are close to one. <laughs> it's actually three and a half percent. And then there's a whole bunch of studies where uh, it's actually not larger, uh, somewhat larger. And then there's a whole number of studies where the willingness to accept compensation is much, much larger than the willingness to pay for the same thing, including for trivial stuff uh, like t-shirts uh, and, and things. Um, it's of course a big difference if you say, well, how much would you be willing to pay to have to buy, say, uh, Rembrandt's Night Watch, right? And it's beyond your budget. Uh, we'll probably go 200 million. Um, but what would the loss be of a unique painting? Uh, a world famous unique painting? That would be counted in the billions, right? So for unique things, this sort of makes sense, right? Actually, if we would now have a painter and say, well, let's paint a picture of uh, 35 men standing around in silly clothes, how much would you be willing to pay for that painter to get that painting? You say, ah, not a whole lot, right? <laughs> Doesn't seem to be particularly attractive. I don't know whether you guys have seen the night watch, but it's not a particularly attractive uh, picture in the first place, right? For unique stuff, Obviously, there should be a difference between willingness to pay and willingness to accept compensation. Um, but this is also for very ordinary stuff. Um, so why is this? Uh, there, is, there are three reasons uh, for this. Um, and the first is the, the Willig one, uh, that the budget constraint is different. <coughs> but that cannot explain large differences in willingness to pay and willingness to accept for small goods that are ordinary. Uh, the second um, reason uh, that people talk about is uh, loss aversion and attaching value to uh, the status quo. So what is willingness to pay? Um, somebody comes knocking on your door and says, you know this parking lot down the road, we got permission from the city council to change it into a park, uh, it will have grass and trees and a fountain and it will be very nice. We got permission to convert uh, this but we did not get any money uh, and we would like you to ask for a contribution. How much would you be willing to pay? for this and you would give a certain amount of money, right? That is willingness to pay. Willingness to accept compensation is somebody comes knocking on your door and says they're going to turn this park down the road, the trees and the grass and the fountain into a parking lot, tarmac and cars. We understand that this means a loss to you, so we're going to offer you money so that you won't protest uh, our plans. How much money would you accept? So as not to protest, right? That is the difference in the scenario. And objectively, the differences are the same, right? It's tarmac and steel versus grass and trees and a fountain. But subjectively, they're not the same, right? This park may be where you have been walking your dog uh, for the last five years. It may be where you kissed that girl for the first time, right? You may have all sorts of memories that sort of makes this more than just grass and trees and a fountain. And for that reason, people sort of say, no, I don't want to lose this, right? Um, and that may explain this difference, right? 
Uh, and there's of course the more generic uh, version that uh, George McCarran uh, would teach you about if you take behavioral, and that is loss aversion. People simply do not like to lose things. Once they have it, it becomes part of their makeup and they don't, part of their identity and they don't want to go without it. Um, <coughs> The other uh, reason that people have offered is that there's a difference between voluntary and involuntary risk. Um, so, tonight you may go out, uh, get drunk, uh, decide to go joyriding, get into an accident and lose your leg, right? That's pretty bad. What may also happen is that I get drunk, I go, driving, I get you into an accident and you lose your leg. Objectively it's the same, right? You lost your leg. Subjectively it's not, right? It's very different if you something bad happens to you because of your own damn fault or if somebody else does this to you. And you would also value things differently if it's a little old lady in a little car who loses control of the wheel and does things to you by accident or whether it's somebody in a, a big Mercedes who got drunk and uh, some rich kid, right? That is different to you. Even though it's not, you just lost your leg, right? And, and objectively it's the same. Uh, so voluntary and involuntary risks are also valued differently. And willingness to accept compensation is of course somebody imposes something on you. Whereas willingness to pay is you go to the supermarket to buy milk. Willingness to accept compensation is you walk out of the supermarket with your milk and somebody, somebody stupid, knocks it out of your hands, right? Much less. Uh, not quite losing a leg, right? Um, <coughs> Now, that explains the difference between willingness to pay and willingness to accept compensation. Now, why does this matter in the context of climate change? There's two ways of looking at climate policy, right? One way is say, we're gonna invest in greenhouse gas emission reduction to buy our children and grandchildren a better climate. That is willingness to pay, right? You can also say, well, climate change is something that is imposed on us by our parents and grandparents, and we would demand compensation for the losses imposed, or our grandchildren would demand compensation, right? And of course, it gets worse when you think, and we'll talk about it the week after next, uh, when it turns out that poorer countries are much more vulnerable to climate change than our richer countries and most of the emissions come from rich countries so climate change is something that will be imposed on the grandchildren of poor people by us, rich people, right? So context is very, very important uh, in these valuation studies and depending on how you phrase climate policy, do we buy a better climate for our children and grandchildren or do we impose a worse, or are, do we get imposed on us a worse climate by our parents and grandparents? The valuation answer would be very, very different.